The Apostles, Acts chapter 11. The Apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of the uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it happened. Then going to verse 18. When they'd heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen travelled as far as I can't pronounce that. Phenonica, sorry. Cyprus and Antioch, telling the message only to the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a, a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians, first at Antioch. During this time, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, one of them named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his, to his ability, decided to provide help for the believers living in Judea. This they did, sending the gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Katrina. As part of the passage, the amazing truth is that we see people appropriating for themselves Jesus Christ as Lord, becoming, as we saw at the end of that passage, Christians rather than anything else, any other name that they could have been called because they were standing in Christ. And we pick that up in our next hymn of worship as we sing together, My Jesus, My Saviour, 1003 in the book.
Can I encourage you to open your Bibles up to Acts chapter 11? And as we do that, let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks, a God who calls into the darkness and brings out light. Lord, as we bring you our hearts today, would you illuminate them? As we bring you our paths today, would you show us the future that you would have us walk in? And in it all and through it all, would you receive the power, the glory, and all the honor. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Sometimes um, books of the Bible get certain connotations for me. And for the book of Acts, the picture that pops into my head is hopefully the image that is going to appear on the screen. That of postcards. Now, I better explain where I'm coming from um, in relation to this. As I'm reading the book of Acts, there's an element in which we're jumping all about the place. We're getting different pictures in different places, and as it were, there's a message coming home saying, this is what God has done in this location or that location. But the problem with postcards, as you'll see as I go into the next slide, there's not much space for writing, is there? I don't know about you, but when I write postcards or fail to write postcards, I'll be honest, I am the friend that goes into the shop when they're on holiday, faithfully buys the postcards that he means to send, and returns with them in my suitcase afterwards. Does anyone else have a friend like that? Or are they a bit like that? Yep, exactly. And some of the issues is, well, one of them, I'm having too much fun getting out and doing things, but on another level, I just feel when I'm sitting down to write the postcard, it all suddenly feels so trite. Just like the weather is hot, the food is spicy, I saw this or that. When you've got a postcard, though, you have to give great thought into what you're going to say in the limited space that you have. And for the most part, the book of Acts is like that. The Gospels, when we have them, and I read the Gospels wishing, why didn't you share more information with us? Or three years of Jesus' life. The book of Acts, 30 years of the work of the Holy Spirit in his church. 30 years, and we are getting basically wee postcards, sharing God did this amazing thing in that place. A whole year in the life of the church is summed up um, in those verses where it talks about Barnabas and Saul being in Antioch. So for a whole year, verse 26, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great, member, great numbers of people. That's one year ticked off. But the interesting thing is Gail alluded to, when you get Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, it's basically like getting a postcard with the same content. We didn't read it um, in relation to what Peter said from verse 5 on to verse 17, but it is almost word for word what Acts chapter 10 says. And that should cause us a pause. Why? When space is so limited, you're trying to get 30 years of church history down into one scroll. It's, it's about the length of a, a long scroll as you, you have them. Um, the same sort of length as the Gospel of, of Matthew or Luke or John, Book of Acts, all about the same sort of length. It was a set length. They had squeezed what they could in. And this story is repeated twice. Why? Well, in one, um, there's the oral history that people would have. Most people couldn't read or write in these days. So if they were to understand and take something in, it was through the process of hearing something said again and again. The first time I went to visit the church in Brazil, I found that jaw-dropping just how many people knew all of the songs without the need for any hymn books. And I'm just standing there because they're singing in Portuguese and trying to engage as best as I could, but the words weren't on the screen because they knew them. They were in their heart, but they'd learnt them in that context. It wasn't written. It didn't need to be. But there's also that element that God is underlining just how important what he is sharing there is. Set up and pay attention. God has no favourites. 
He's not blinded by bigotry, racism, sexism, or any other ism. He wants everyone in the whole world to have the opportunity to respond to the gospel. And here, as the passage repeats what happened as Peter went, had the vision, visited Cornelius, and the Holy Spirit came, it's meant to say, look, God is truly at work in this place. Underline it in our hearts. This is what God has done. He wants people out there, our neighbors, our friends, the people that we bump into randomly in the streets to know that he is at work. And in all of this, he wants the good news to be shared. So that is why this story is repeated. But I want to say that it's repeated for a few other reasons. First of all, the story is repeated because it is controversial. And we have to know that it is true. Look at verse 1. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and you ate with them. Can you picture Peter? He's taking the road from the coast back into um, the main part of the country, thinking about the amazing things that he has seen God do. And when he arrives, the church says, what did you do that for? Are you out of your mind, Peter? You met with uncircumcised people. You ate with them. Now, for all of us in our day and age, this doesn't feel controversial. But for the people living at the time, goodness me, it was. It was something that they in their heads and in their hearts for years and years had thought the world was ordered this way, and it wasn't. It's as though they've suddenly discovered that the world is round, is a globe, in fact. That the picture that they're meant to have is so much bigger, but for some of them, that felt incredibly uncomfortable. You might think as this passage deals with the issue that that would be it. It's not. When we get to Acts chapter 15, we discover that there's big, big issues going on, that people are going around trying to force people to be circumcised so that they might um, be at one with them in this relation. But that's not what it's all about. God was doing something greater, something amazing. And unfortunately, some people wanted to say, well, I disagree. I'm not sure that that is right. You may recognize the picture on the screen. It's not a picture of Paul going back to Jerusalem, but rather of Martin Luther putting his 95 theses up on Wittenberg Cathedral door. The interesting thing about all of this is he has discovered that there is a problem with the the picture of Christianity that he has. He's talking about it in the context of indulgences, saying that you shouldn't be able to pay your way into God's favor. You shouldn't be able to think of it in any other way than the grace of God coming into our lives and saying, will you believe in Jesus as a savior? Just like Peter did, immediately when Martin Luther did this, he faced oppositions. He was called up not to appear in front of a small church gathering. He was called in front of the Pope to be disciplined for what he had done. And he was given the option, will you recant? And he ends up saying, no, I can only stand here and share the truth. I know in my own life, there have been points where God has told me, it would be good for you to do this. In fact, the first time he did this, he said, Alistair, I want you to set up a scripture union group at your school. And I was away in um, Keswick at the time at the convention. And I was thinking, okay, that's great. Surrounded by young people, this is going to be amazing. On the car, on the way back, I hear a whisper in my ear, who are you to think that you could set up an SU group? Challenge comes immediately when God speaks. So often uh, things are thrown against us. We go to a group and say, this is what we're thinking. And they go, are you really sure you're thinking that? Are you really sure that's coming from God? 
And don't get me wrong, it is right to have things tested so that we can be assured that we truly are walking God's way. But where I have the problem is the times in my life where I have said to myself, no, I can't do this, even though it's been God who has called us to do it. You'd be glad to hear that the Scripture Union Group did get set up by, um, by a few of us in my school, because I didn't walk alone in relation to that. In fact, that's one of the big things. When the going gets tough, surround yourself with good people. When Barnabas gets to Antioch, he goes looking for Saul in Tarsus. He says, will you come and work with me? When we hear God's voice, we're to call others alongside us to say, yes, that is what God is saying. Because there are times we do get it wrong, let's be honest. So yes, that is what God is doing. How can I support you in it? But this was controversial. It was something that the church wrestled with over um, a couple of generations. Did you need to be circumcised? Did you need to obey all the Old Testament law? But this book, as we remember at the beginning of the book of Acts and Luke, was written so that the, the, those that were receiving it would know the truth. This is controversial, but get to the truth. That's what we are called to do as well, constantly to seek God's truth in every circumstance, the truth above any other truth, and to live life in light of it. Second thing about it is that it's repeated twice because this is amazing. It's for you and for me. Again, the picture is interesting. Um, it is Moses leading the people through the Red Sea. And you're thinking, what does that have to do with anything? Well, Gail mentioned that there's not many times in the Bible where two stories are told back to back. But this is one of them. Where Moses is going through the Red Sea, and then immediately afterwards, he leads the people in a song. A song that is then repeated by his sister Miriam. So in, in the book of Exodus, there are two chapters there that look very, very similar. One of them is a literal account of the people going across the sea. The next passage immediately is them singing a song about walking through the sea, dried up, and what God has done. The image there and why it came to my mind was the way that God's theology should lead to doxology, or what God has done, truths about God should lead to praise. It's not meant to be abstract. When something is shared in this way twice, it's to produce praise. That's what happens, as we see in, in verse 18. When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. For them, I think it's not a case of even as an, oh, I can't believe he's done this. They're thinking those people are so far away from anyone that we think could be saved. Isn't it amazing that God's salvation even reaches to them and brings them in? But as I was thinking about this in, in another level, about this is amazing, it's for me and for you. My heart burns when I read particular chapters in the book of Acts, and, and this is one of them, Acts chapter 10 and 11, because I realize that without these passages, I would be on the outside. I would not be welcomed into the church, but for the fact that God said, this is for you. And there is an element that I love that this passage is, is repeated twice because it underlines for the Gentile hearers of this book, the readers of the book, it is likely that this was written for Gentiles. They're reading this and thinking, wow, this is for me. It reminds me of what I do at infant baptisms when I'm holding the young person. Let's call them George just because I couldn't think of a George here today. If, if you are a George, apologies for using your name. Say, George, for you, Jesus Christ came into the world. For you, he lived and showed God's love. 
For he was rejected, abandoned, nailed to the cross, and he cried at last, it is accomplished, the price is paid. And for you, he triumphed over death and rose in newness of life. For you, he ascended to reign at God's right hand. All this he did for you, George, though you do not yet know it. And so the word of scripture is fulfilled. We love God because God first loved us. Now, the point of Christian discipleship, the point of coming to church as young people and going through Christian education is to get to the point of knowing it, to say, yes, that was for me. The great historical events in the Bible aren't matters just to be known, they're matters to be lived because the Bible is for us. I think there's one way that this passage is a repeat of chapter 10, because actually the people were so amazed at saying the message of salvation isn't for them, but it's for me. Now, some of you may recognize this guy uh, that's up on the screen. It's Rico Tice, the guy who created the Christianity Explored course and a few other courses. But I had the blessing a few different times to hear him preach and at one of them, he said, one of the things I have in my wallet at all times is the Bible passage that I came to faith with. So if I've ever in a situation where someone wants me to share their story, to show why the Bible is relevant, I can pull it out and I can show them. I can say, this is what God said to me, and this is why I live it out. Well, a couple of weeks later, I was visiting the minister who um, had invited Rico to speak at the church and said, Alistair, have you done it yet? Of course I hadn't, let's be honest. I hadn't gone and got a copy. He took me straight to the photocopier in the church, printed out um, Revelation chapter 2, which is my message when I, I came to faith. I realized that I'd never loved Jesus. The passage was talking about all the good work that you could do as a Christian. But if you hadn't Jesus... Oh, you were in trouble. And so for a few years, I had that. It was one of my foundational passages. I think for so many people who were of Gentile origins, this would have been one of theirs. A passage that they didn't walk about with in their wallet, but they did in their heart in the way that it had been taught to them. Are you able to say that Jesus came into the world for me? that he lived and showed God's love for me, that he was rejected, abandoned, nailed to a cross for me, and he triumphed over death for me. Can you say that? Are there foundational passages like this in your life that you cling to? And if someone said to you, why do you have a hope in God? You're able to point to this or others and say, well, the message came to the Gentiles, of which I am one, and I have life through God in that. So it's worth sharing because it's controversial and we want to know it's true. This is amazing. It's for you and for me. And finally, this is for others, so get sharing it too. The staggering thing is that not everyone, as soon as they heard Peter, sharing this great message, got on their bikes, well, they didn't have bikes, on their feet to share the message with those around. But some did. The church in Antioch began to grow. And when it began to grow, the church's headquarters said, hmm, we better see what's going on there. We better check that they're all legitimate. And they were, of course. The sad thing is that it didn't involve everyone. It only involved a few. The picture that we were invited to participate in is that of disciples making disciples. We were praying about this at the prayer meeting yesterday morning. And the truth is that each and every one of you as disciples of Jesus Christ can get into mission fields that I could not get into because you alone work in the place that you work. You have the friendship groups that you have that are totally different from my friendship groups. You live in a different house to me, unless you're part of my family. And because of that, your mission field is unique. And you, like those that went to Antioch, 
can share the good news in that setting, can go with it. The picture I had here was that the story has been shared twice because you've got an extra one. It means that you can give to someone else. If you haven't looked already at them, I would encourage you to look at the prayer cards that we have in the vestibule area there and also in the entry to the church as you come through the hall complex. One simple take-home thing I'm inviting you to do if you don't want to photocopy the Bible passage that you first heard God speak in. Take two of those and think about who you might give one to during this week. We have a great story. It's one to be kept, but also one to be shared. Because in all of this, this is where Christians first became Christians. That they needed a name that wasn't Jew because they were more than Jew. That wasn't holy Gentile because they were more than holy Gentile. They chose to be, well, what? Christian, which literally means in Christ. Someone that stands in Christ, that belongs in Christ, that could say all of the things that I talked about a moment or two ago that you use at baptism. They became known as Christians first at Antioch because it was clear that they were his above anything else. Is that our number one identity? As we think about belonging in him, as we think about living in him, as we think about sharing him, and as we think about remaining true to him. In our world, there are so many other identities, so many other things that we could be known. Are we known as Christ's, in Christ, for Christ, and in him alone? It's a challenging passage that invites us to get to the truth where there is controversy, that invites us to appropriate gospel truths for ourselves and live them out, and invites us to share them with the world. That was the calling of the church all those years ago, and sadly, not all of them pick that up. Which picture are we going to find ourselves in? Are we going to be in the passive church? That when he, they hear God's voice, thinks, hmm, right, I'll accept that, but I'm not going to do much about it. Or are we going to be like Barnabas and Saul, who see God at work and saying, yes, I am with you in that, Lord Jesus. Let's go and do it. That's where we're meant to be, isn't it? We're going to sing now a, a confession of faith. I believe in Jesus, 264, if you're following in a book.
And let us pray. Lord, forgive us for when we've closed our eyes to what you've said or what you've done. And we think that we can just get on with things our own way. We can sweep your call under the carpet and hopefully ignore it. Lord, open our eyes again. Help us to see where you are at work and to say yes and amen. Help us to test one another's calling, but help us to do it in a loving and a winsome way that gets to the truth of what you are saying. And where someone hears your voice and responds, help us to accompany them, to draw alongside them, and to support them as they exercise the ministry that you have in store for them. We thank you, Lord God, that we do not work alone, but that you are always with us, working in ways that we cannot see, but faithful to yourself and to your promise. We thank you that you are good and your love endures. So, Lord, in your mercy and your grace, would you fill us with your spirit and enable us to catch a vision of what you are doing. Help us not to give up when the going gets tough, but to stay true to you and stay true to the vision that you place in our lives. Lord, we continue to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are persecuted for your name's sake. Help them to shine for you, to live for you, to be winsome so that those around them would discover the amazing hope that is found in you. But help them also to be wise, to know who to speak to and when to remain silent. We pray, Lord God, for those who are in vulnerable positions at this time. We think about those that are worried about their kids going to school because of concrete issues over the last few days. And ask, Lord, that you would be with head teachers and others as they make decisions. Help them to be wise in making them. And Lord God, that there would just be a sense of safety for our young people and for those that are in hospitals or indeed any other buildings that were built using these concrete purposes. Lord, would you be at work? We pray, Lord God, beyond that for our kids returning to school in England, asking a blessing upon them, asking that you would be at work in their lives and preparing a niche and a future for them, somewhere that is exactly right for each and every one of them. We pray for those that are in hospital or who are undergoing treatment, asking that you would be work with them, healing them according to your eternal purposes, giving them every bit of strength that they need. We pray for our own, um, our, those in our own fellowship who are in that position those who we know, those whom we love. Surround them even in this moment with a touch of your hand and a blessing of your spirit. And Lord God, we pray for the opportunities that we will have this week to speak of you. Help us to grab them, to talk with you at all times and be eager to see where you are inviting us to speak of you. Help us to share why we have hope. Help us to speak of you always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the things that I kind of see as we look at Acts chapter 11 is that God isn't doing a new plan. He's actually just bearing fruition to his original plan working things out to bring all of us into his saving grace. And we pick that up in Salvation Song, our final item of praise this afternoon, Loved Before the Dawn of Time.
So go and make the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ known. Apply it in your life. Live it each day. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.